Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode number two of Metal Raps. We've made it to two episodes officially. I'm here with Mitch LaFon from One on One with Mitch LaFon and Mark Striegel of Talking Metal. Gentlemen, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Mitch. Absolutely fantastic. I, I love doing this with you two guys. It's, it's, it's a great to have a discussion about metal and not always interviewing some rock star about his latest project. You fall in love real fast, Mitch. I do. I do. <laughs> I think that's what's kept me in this game for 20 or 25 years, this, this passion for anything rock. So it's interesting to be back this week because Paul Diano is back. Most people will probably recognize the name as the front man of Iron Maiden, not Bruce Dickinson. Paul was there from 1978 to 1981. Uh, I guess it was. it's also interesting to note that when he was relieved of duties or when he relieved his duty, we don't know what happened, um, that, that there, was a, there was quite the battle between, I think it was him and Steve Harris, the bassist, and apparently Rod Smallwood, the manager, legendary manager for Iron Maiden, stepped in. And I, I found out in digging through the, the, uh, the, the annals of, of rock that he actually gets no royalties for having uh, taken part in those first two seminal albums. And yet he's still around and doing a lot of stuff. And Mitch, you spent quite a bit of time with him interviewing him about, I guess, his new band, which is called Architects of Chaos. And he's got a brand new DVD CD thing coming out called The Beast Arises. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I did ask him about those royalties because that's that big kind of thing that everybody talks about. And Paul did say, well, uh, I do get four checks a year, but who knows, right? Yeah, if that's royalties, if that's like performance royalties, uh, you know, he, he did, he has songwriting credit on what, at least three, three, maybe three, four songs on mm -hmm. those first two records. So it's possible he signed away songwriting publishing but he still gets uh, performance royalty or or who knows you know it's it's very possible that it's all signed away too but yeah. the guy the guy likes to rock and roll still right like i mean he's got to be i'm going to guess late 50s uh, he still goes out there it's it, it can be quite contentious i mean he was never somebody that i was really laser focused in on, but I do remember these sort of like Paul Diano touring and then Paul Diano cancels tour or like those sorts yeah. of <laughs> things that would happen historically as these guys get older, uh, maybe audience gets smaller, less interested. Uh, Mitch? Yeah, you know, Paul, well, Paul's had some, some immigration problems getting into Canada and the US, so he'll announce these wonderful tours with 20 dates and then he'll get to customs and they'll say, listen, you can't get in here. And so everything gets canceled. But he's really out there. He, he's shaking the tail as much as he can. And he even announced a, a farewell tour. He said, listen, I've injured my knee. I can't do this anymore. And you know what? He just keeps going and going and going. And, of course, he's got that new band that you mentioned before. And he's got the new DVD. And he is, you know, he has recorded three brand new songs that he sent me that will be on an album eventually. He keeps going. That the man yeah. is is a beast, quite honestly. Do we like him? Do we not like him, Mark? Oh, I I love the guy. I mean, I think I th I think he is when you meet him in person, one of the nicest guys. I had the pleasure of interviewing him in person at his hotel in New Jersey, and that night he was playing a show in the city, and he basically said to me. When the interview ended, you know, we kind of were getting chummy and he was like, uh, you know what? It would save me a lot of money if I canceled my car service and just had you drive me to the gig. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that's what I did. And, you know, we sat in traffic on the way into the city and he was just telling so many great stories. He's such a, a great conversational guy and you'll hear that on Mitch's interview that he did on episode 41 of one on one with Mitch LaFon but I, I feel like there, there's there's something off with his career I, I, I feel I just I wish that he wouldn't continue to put out the old maiden songs over and over and over again in these live versions the the DVD I I saw um, a clip from that on on Blabbermouth or something. It was Charlotte the Harlot, the classic 
Maiden song that Dave Murray wrote off the first Iron Maiden record, and I, I thought I thought it sounded quite bad, honestly. Ugh. And I, I just really wish he had some kind of management or somebody that that would take care of him and and say, you know, when you put out stuff like this over and over again, that you may actually be harming your career instead of, you know, enhancing it and somebody to guide him away from just not making the fast buck, you know? But do you, you, like, I mean, let's take a a little step back here. Do you feel also that, like, it's really hard to be anybody but Bruce Dickinson when you hear of Iron Maiden and that if you're going to bank your career primarily on those first two albums, and he's done a lot since then, there's no doubt about it, just none of it really had a lot of traction. I mean, he was doing right. the Killers thing for a bit. He's got the Battle Zone going. Uh, you could definitely point to what happened in those first two Maiden albums as the very nascent stages of the new wave of British heavy metal. There's no doubt about it. But he's never really ascended. I don't think, at least, at least career-wise, beyond that. And I don't mean to disparage him because if you if you look at what he brought to Maiden in those first two albums, I would say that his style wasn't. This the air raid siren. You know his style was yeah. punk. His style was mm-hmm. real metal. His his style was there, and so expecting him to come out and suddenly sound. You know a lot of the songs that he even did on his first two albums. When we hear them in our heads, we hear them as Bruce Dickinson singing them because yeah. that's just been our natural motion towards it. So it's sort of one of those things where he might be even saying, and I know he did with you, Mitch, that his voice, he feels his voice is better than ever in a pure punk, raw, delivering it format. It may be in terms of how many of us want to hear the songs as fans, probably not. Well, you know, I'll just go to the songs that I've heard. I've heard a song called Rejected, Horseman, and Dead Eyes. Those are the three songs I've heard, and they sound fantastic. They really do sound great, so... I guess, you know, he is sort of moving forward. And, I, and his voice, you know, for, for the style of singing that he does, he doesn't need his voice to sound like Whitney Houston. He needs to have this <laughs> grumpy, gra- you know, raw warts and all kind of thing because that's the kind of metal he's doing. It's not pretty metal. It's not, you know, a Bon Jovi song. So, yeah. you know, I, I like Paul. Uh, we, we've had a relationship through email and I've met him a few times that that spans probably 15 years now and he's always been exceptionally nice exceptionally polite exceptionally you know uh, endearing and wanting to do stuff and i don't know are but, we being cautious because he's got crazy tattoos and we're worried he's gonna, like finally get into <laughs> north america and kick our asses <laughs> yeah no, i mean the thing about it a little ahead, <laughs> we're older <laughs> No, it's not a question of kicking our asses. I think that he's had some probably bad management, bad decisions made, a lot of them probably bad personal decisions. But that doesn't take away from the talent. I, I think he just has an unrealized potential. And that's the story you know, for think, a lot of people in this world. I think like the song he did with Jakey Lee – on the Red Dragon Cartel record. Mm-hmm. I thought I think his voice sounds great on that song and I'm sure his voice is going to sound great on this new studio material he's he's working on. Mm-hmm. However, he he just needs to stop putting out the old maiden stuff where his voice is is like I mean on that Charlotte the Harlot clip that I watched on Blabbermouth, he's he's he it's not about oh he doesn't have the you know the the range or anything like that it's simply about pitch he's out of tune i mean and and that somebody needed to step in and say you can't be putting stuff out like that you're better than this you know I think, it, it, I think- was this shot on an off night i don't know i saw him in new york i thought in 2009 i thought he was awesome but that's the thing too, Mark. I think that a little bit of it is that if we can all agree that his style is punk street underground, I'm willing to even forego the pitch issue so long as the energy is there and it feels right. And yeah. part of the challenge is when you see gigs like that, there is always a little part, I think, in all of us that wishes it was more, better, this because we have such a passion for the music. I mean, I do get down when I see artists 
play these smaller venues and they seem off or the players don't seem great. You just feel like it's not moving in the direction we want it to because one is we all have really high expectations because we're living off of our youth. And so everything in the rearview mirror looks and sounds better. You right. want to see these new bands come out and just crush. So even when those little nuanced things are happening, it's easy for us to get thrown off. Yeah, because you're right. competing sure. with your memory and you can never – beat your memory because your memory is always perfect right you're always like well oh, they were so awesome in 1983 they were so awesome in 1987 and quite frankly they probably weren't that awesome in 1987 you were just happened to be 14 and weren't that critical you didn't know any better mark that's what the problem is yeah. you didn't know any better man <laughs> no, <laughs> you're but, a young punk <laughs> but, but here you know I, I don't like being critical of paul but I, i'll say this with the dvd and some of these shows it's because he goes into these markets alone and then hires local maiden tribute bands to back him up. And those guys are not professional players. They don't know how to hit the marks. They don't know how to get those fills right. And so when you're singing with a band behind you that's not at the level of a maiden or of a kiss or of a Van Halen, you're going to be singing all crooked because where you're expecting that punch and that fill, it's not going to be there. And you're going to go, uh. And it's also not Frank Sinatra. I mean, I don't right. like. I didn't. I didn't even know he did that. And just hearing that, you just my sort of my shoulders sort of slumped. Went, uh because yeah. of course the gelling of the team and being yes. on the road and the rehearsing and the practicing and the sound check versus like here's some sheet music, boys, and like be ready. I'll be there at five. It, it's like it, it doesn't even feel metal. No, and it yeah. goes from you know when he was uh, in Quebec the last time he did like Quebec and 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 Montreal with an Iron Maiden Quebec band. And then he moved over to Ontario two days later and had an Ontario tribute band. And then he went down to wherever and wherever and had local bands there. He does mm -hmm. the same thing in Europe. Now, this is where Architects of Chaos comes in. He swears to me that this is the band. These are the guys that he's going to tour with. And therefore, everything will be up. The game is going to get up. I hope so. Because, again, I've heard three of the new songs they sound great. They were done with those guys. They practice. They live. Well, they don't live together, but they live in the same area. They can get together. Maybe it'll work. Hey, you know, you know, when when you said, when you guys we talked about this and we said, hey, we're going to talk about Paul Diano. It, it brought a thought to mind, and I can't think of any scenario like this. I'm curious if you guys can. So, Paul Diano leaves Iron Maiden mm -hmm. uh, after two albums. Can we think of any other band where a singer? left a band that then went on to become massively huge, sure. but he in and of himself became bigger than that band? Well, Ozzy. Like, um, Ozzy okay, Ozzy is a great, Ozzy. Ozzy's a great example. Ozzy I was thinking became... too, a little bit, I mean, clearly not Dave Mustaine and Megadeth, but he still did, did quite a bit. I mean, we could not <laughs> discount that. No. But I mean, a solo seer, I think Ozzy, see, I didn't even think of Ozzy. Ozzy's a good one. Anyone well, else? Yeah, I would say David Coverdale. I mean, he essentially, I mean, he kept the white snake That's name, true. That's yeah. true. But he replaced all the players, and it was just David Coverdale by himself with a brand name behind him. But he didn't have a yeah. band behind him. That's a great one, too. Those are yeah. both great. Yeah, Especially no, I, he was in Deep Purple, too. So yeah, totally. Yeah. You, you would never have thought that. But the in, interesting guy, nonetheless. So, hey. The guys it, who have gone solo, though, that's, I'm trying to think of anybody else. I mean, I guess Dio also, he, well, he yeah. started did Elf and then Sabbath, and then, but only did like two Sabbath albums, went solo, and he was pretty big. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it is a rare thing. Yes, it, was, it was interesting. I was wondering, like, you know, because that must be a hard hill to climb. You have a band like Iron Maiden become that massive, and then how do yeah. you, as a solo singer, whether you start another band or not, do that? And I think Ozzy and David Coverdale are a really but, great but example of that. Mitch, you, you more than Mark and I understand the power of a brand. It's not that they're overcoming their vocal talents or their guitar talent. They're overcoming a brand, and that totally. is exceptionally difficult to do. That is why Ace Fraley is not as big as Kiss. That is why Paul Diano is not as big as Maiden. That is why Neil Turbin is not as big as Anthrax. You can't overcome that brand. It's the brand name that just drives it home. Now, sometimes it is hard. It, it, it's an interesting topic, too, because I think even thinking about Iron Maiden in the construct of a Paul Diano and relevancy is just, it's one of those yeah. things that is, is supremely interesting. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, those first two, I mean, you mentioned earlier, Mitch, about, you know, some people might know the Paul Diano era stuff 
more with Bruce Dickinson singing it. I, for me personally, though, those two first two Maiden records were just such an important part of my youth. And I don't even like hearing Bruce sing the Paul Diano era stuff. And, and, and I think that's why when I go online and I see these clips off this DVD and they are far from perfect sounding, it, it really upsets me. It's funny, I, too. It, it is that Bon Scott type of ACDC thing, too. Like, I think the purists like you, Mark, feel that way. I think people yeah. like me who probably got into Maiden early days of Bruce Dickinson sort of went back and go, I didn't even know they had another singer. And right, so it's, right. a, it's a different construct. But, but I, I totally think that that's the purest mentality, and that's what makes it it's so special. Well, guys, let's, let's wrap up Metal Raps number two and agree to do this sometime soon and try and keep this as regular as possible. So, hey, yeah. I like to do this at the end of my show, so I'm going to do it here. Why don't you guys let people know where they can best connect to all the great stuff you're doing? Mitch, start off. Uh, Mitch, uh, one-on-one with Mitch LaFon. You can find me on Facebook at one on or Facebook at one-on-one with Mitch and, of course, at Mitch LaFon on Twitter. Mark? Yeah, and we, we also have Mitch's podcasts posted on TalkingMetal.com or TalkingMetalDigital.com and that's where you can find me. I do the Talking Metal podcast and we have it on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn. So, uh, and iHeartRadio. Yeah, actually, I don't think Talking Metal is on iHeart quite yet, um, but one you on are. One-on-one one on one on one with it, Mitch LaFon is on, is on iHeart. iHeart. That, that's, yes. To me, that's very, very big, actually. So I'm, I'll make a call for you, Mark. We'll get you there. Yeah, we got to <laughs> remove the music from the from the show. And oh, that's I, I right. Think, yeah. I think then it'll happen. Yeah. So and, uh, and, and if so you want to, yeah, and if you want to follow me for anything, uh, everything unrelated to metal marketing, if you're trying to figure out your brand or business, whatever it is, just uh, follow me on Twitter. It's Mitch Joel. So hey guys, thanks again for doing this. A lot of fun. Let's make sure to come back soon. Right. Thank Absolutely. you.